<laughs> Our next reader, Philip Giam. Philip is a product of the streets of South Philadelphia. He obtained his deviant perspective on life listening to Gene Shepard on WR Radio out of New York City as a teenager. He fled Philly at 17, served in the military, has been an actor, laborer, hairstylist, janitor, writer, recording engineer, banker, announcer, photographer, stoner, and computer geek. He came to St. Mark's Place in 1970 as a worn out hippie and never left. Please welcome Philip Giambri. Hired me out to this <laughs> I'm going to have to sit down. I'm tired. <laughs> Too crude for the venue. The last time I read here, uh, one of the producers, I won't mention his name, when I finished, he said he really liked my material, but he thought it was a little too crude for this venue. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila, if you're out there tonight, I'm not going to take my shirt off and show my tattoos again. That's an insult to this venue. <laughs> this is a crude venue. <laughs> so let's, yeah, okay, I want to clear that. I may be too crude for the venue. What the hell is love? I'm eight years old. I know one thing for sure. <laughs> I love my mother. At 12, I think I'm in love with Jesus. At 14, I think I love Maureen, but she likes my best friend. At 16, I'm in love with Cass, but I'm dating her best friend. At 18, I'm just angry. I think nobody loves me. I hate everybody. At 21, Rosie loves me. For almost a year, I'm too drunk to notice that she's a hooker. <laughs> and I'm too drunk to care because I don't even love her. At 23, I'm madly in love with Carol. Or even engaged until she dumps me at 25. I confess I really want to be an actor and not the middle class banker I promised her. Well, I'm being selfish, I know, but I was still heartbroken. At 26, Sharon and I are madly in love. But she tortures me with endless flirtations constant test to prove my love for her. After three years of anxiety, frustration, anger, everything, I just fell out of love. It's over. It's then she becomes the woman I thought I originally fell in love with. It's too late. She asked if we could at least be fuck buddies. I said, okay. <laughs> at 30, I'm in love with Eileen. It's the beginning of women's lib. She weighs our relationship in terms of what her women's group feels is appropriate. She dumps me because they say I'm too sexist and not a sensitive enough guy for her. Well, she leaves a parting message in my answering machine. It says, thank you, you helped me grow. At 32, I'm living with Susan. She's a free spirit. She feels that an open sexual relationship is what she needs to fulfill herself as a woman. She runs off to Toronto and living in a teepee with some hippie, and she leaves her needy sister behind until I work up the guts to kick her out. Now, I sleep with a lot of women during those summers of free love. I don't have much fun. And I got the clap three times. <laughs> a friend of mine a telling observation. He says, you know, all the women you fall in love with, they're the same person. They just look different. Wow. A moment of clarity here. She offers me a blind date with her friend to prove a point. I accept. And I think I feel real love for the very first time. Yet, here, 40 years later, I'm still asking myself, what the hell is love? And I realize I might never know the answer. It seems more now an abstraction rather than some tangible sensation. I'm 70 years old, and I think I know less about love than when I started. I'm really grateful for all the love I've been given, but I have no real feel sense of what I ever honestly returned. This, this one's a little bit. Oh, thank you. <laughs> if you, that poem is on uh, my web 
page, and uh, my friend John and his wife were nice enough to pose for the picture for them. Uh, this is kind of a time capsule from 1963, so there's some vernacular in here that's not really acceptable today, but at the time it was okay. Don't have to go with it. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, there's some gray-haired guys here, you can ask them, they'll explain it to you. It's the summer of 1963. I'm returning from the States for my last Cold War submarine patrol. At a duty-free shop in Presswick, Scotland, I'm allowed to purchase four imperial quarts of whiskey. That's five American quarts. That's more than a gallon of booze. I hit the States. I'm ready to party. Doc and I leave New London, Connecticut by train. We're headed for a weekend in Philly where both of our families are from. Doc's a lifer in the Navy. He's in forever. He's about 10 years older than me. He's from North Philly. I'm from South Philly. He's a Negro. I'm not. Uh, we spent four patrols together. He's got my back, I got his back. We know we can handle whatever could happen to two horny sailors on a train with two and a half gallons of booze. Uh, we take seats in the last row on the last car on the train. Our backs are against the bathroom wall. We're facing the water fountain. Two seats facing us are the only empty seats on the car when the train leaves the station. Apparently nobody wants to sit across from two sailors who are pouring scotch from a large bottle at the paper cups from the water fountain. That's perfect. Our welcome home party is well on the way. At New Haven, two women look to be in their mid-twenties. They can come on the train or stand alongside our seat. We get a really icy cold look. And one of them finally says, uh, excuse me, would you mind getting your feet off the seats? We'd like to sit down. We apologize and we keep looking now. We're trying to act like uh, we're busy pouring scotching cups. Meanwhile, across the aisle from us is a big group of college kids, and they've been watching us all this time drink. They finally work up the guts and they ask us if we mind sharing some with them. I said, sure, get some cups from the water fountain over there. So they grab a bunch of cups, they fill them up, and then shortly thereafter, the uh, two ladies sitting across from us ask if they too might share a drink. We said, you can grab a couple more cups. We filled them up. And thus we began our mission of mercy. <laughs> Getting every one of the rear half of our train <laughs> totally smashed by the time we hit them. And that's including the conductor. <laughs> Doc asked one of the girls if she'd mind switching seats with him. So now we're both sitting next to two really nice little babes. By the time we make New Brunswick, they're way past tipsy. I asked the lady seated next to me what her name is. She giggles, and then she says, Gwenny, but you can call me Ouija. And then she giggles again. I got a good buzz by now, but I, I check, she's really good looking. I mean, she has really deep black skin. She's got a beautiful face and a beehive hairdo. You know, the ones that the Supremes wear. She's wearing tight-fitting dungarees, a way too small t-shirt. And she's got a chest. That looks like the bumper guards on a 55 Cadillac Eldorado. You all guys know it then. <laughs> Maybe this is what love is. With everyone drinking our booze, we kill three bottles of scotch by the time we hit the North Philly station. Doc suddenly jumps up, hey, this is my stop, this is my stop. A chorus of drunken voices behind us starts yelling, stay on the train, stay on the train. <laughs> we got the booze. So even the ladies join in. And then they invite us to join them in Chester, Pennsylvania to continue to party. I give Doc a look of desperation here. I push him back down a seat, pour another round of drinks, he's in. Right. We hit 30th Street Station. We give a quart of scotch to our new friends on the train, and we leave to loud cheers and applause with the girls. Well, we board a train for Chester, we pour a couple more drinks, and we dazzle the girls with tall tales of life at sea. We're a couple of well-heeled, well-oiled, silver-haired devils here. We catch a cab, we're headed for Ouija's apartment. I ask her what she does, and she says she's a dancer. She and Wanda are dancers. Very cool. I'm thinking like go-go dancers, you know, the TV show Shindig, they're in a cage, white yeah. vinyl knee boots, white vinyl mini skirts, low-cut things, you know, like, wow, that's okay, yeah, okay. Well, Ouija and I are making out hot and heavy in the back seat of the cab now. And I overhear Wanda whispering to Doc, what's with the white guy? What's he doing hanging out with us? Doc says, don't worry, he's good. Are you sure? I said he's good, drop it. She does, never comes up again. Now we're in Ouija's living room. 
we got ice cubes and we got glasses with our drinks. The girl switched to rum and coke. Wanda puts dedicated to the one I love on the record player. Ouija and I are dancing real slow, very tight, and we're grinding hip to hip. We're making out a lot of tongue going on there. When the song ends, Wanda leans in and says to Ouija, let's do it. They smile and they leave for the bedroom. Doc and I chug down another scotch. When the girls come out of the bedroom, they're wearing tassel pasties, tiny sequin G-strings, and spike heel shoes. Holy shit, they're strippers! Doc and I look at each other like two gold miners who just hit the mother loader. <laughs> Widgie puts on an R&B record with a heavy backbeat, and they're bumping and grinding their way through their routines so it was like inches away from our face. Uh, I don't know, the combination of the music, the scotch, the perfume, the erotic dancing, too much, uh, too much stimulation. I just spent 60 days underwater in the North Atlantic. <laughs> Within milliseconds of the music ending, Ouija and I are both naked on her bed. And we're trying to fill hands, eyes, mouth, every available body part with each other. To this day, I have never encountered a woman with such an incredible body. Wow. I mean, we're talking Playboy magazine here. Yeah, I know. You have, there's never going to be a lot of show a color girl in a centerfold, but, but she's really hot. And she's sweet and she's funny, and I'm totally absorbed with her for the whole weekend. We're smoking, drinking, occasionally eating, mostly making love through an amazing two days and nights. I mean, it's just me and her discovering how incredible two bodies can make each other feel. I can't say for sure what caused the magic that weekend. Might have been my forced abstinence. Her magnetism, just plain lust maybe, despite with a lot of booze. But whatever the chemistry happened, resulted in a physical stamina that I had never experienced before and have never again since. I was fucking amazing. <laughs> Even Ouija said so. Well, in the day two. Sunday morning comes. She and Wanda escort Doc and I back to the train station. I don't want to go, ever. Ouija and I cling to each other until Doc finally grabs me by the neck and pulls me to the train. I give her my address. I tell her to write me. The stone sound on the train as it pulls out of the station and the girls are waving us off. We don't say another word till we change trains in Philly. Well, for the next two weeks, all I can think about is Ouija. I'm replaying that weekend in my head over and over. Doc says I'm acting like a little sick puppy. Hey, it's just a weekend thing. We had some fun, end of story. I got a knot in my stomach until a letter finally arrives, and I'm really excited when I'm opening it. Ouija says she misses me, and she can't stop thinking about me. She wants to come to New London and be with me. Uh-oh, that's not what I was expecting. The fantasy suddenly takes a hard right into reality. There's a large neon no flashing bright red in my head all of a sudden. Do I really have the guts to stand up to my family and my friends and all this shit that's going to come down on both of us and we're a couple? Am I going to spend a lot of time pondering this heavy moral and ethical dilemma? No. Me? I'm listening to Mr. Willie, my little man voice down here. He's saying, do you really think you could ever live up to Ouija's expectations after that weekend? Come on, you're an average guy with average parts and not a hell of a lot of experience. You want her to see that you are a one-hit wonder? Or would you rather she just remembers you as White Lightning? <laughs> <laughs> you see what's happening here. If I see her again, which I really want to do, in my mind I'm planting the seeds for failure, which will definitely happen now because I'm worried about it. So, taking a stand for what's right and what I believe in takes a back seat to my little man voice. He's saying, quit while you're ahead. <laughs> Remember the prom? Don't be a fucking loser again. <laughs> well, I punk out. I never answered the letter or the next two. My fragile ego is spared embarrassment, but my moral compass takes a big hit. So much for the idealistic philosophic seeker of truth. When push comes to shove, I'm a real man, I think with my dick. <laughs> Thank
speech is called My, My Brief Career as a Porn Star. <laughs> I'm 27 and my girlfriend works for a talent agency back by the boys downtown. We're really broke and one night she asked me if I would be interested in an audition for a porn movie to make some fashion. I think they might be right. Maybe this is too crude for the venue. We'll say this for now. <laughs> <laughs> 